The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Are you making the most of your KiwiSaver investment? Generate is an award-winning KiwiSaver provider with a track record of strong long-term performance. Making a smart decision now could add tens of thousands of dollars by the time you reach retirement. Book a no-obligation chat with a Generate KiwiSaver advisor today at generatekiwisaver.co.nz slash advice. A copy of the product disclosure statement is available at generatekiwisaver.co.nz. The issuer of the scheme is Generate Investment Management Limited and, of course, past performance does not guarantee future returns. I'm Toby Manhire and this is Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. A podcast in six parts. Doesn't give my opponents much time to run up to an election, does it? This nation is at risk. What do you think you're up to now, you perverted little liar? I can smell the uranium on it as you lean towards it. <laughs> There's a radical overhaul in the history of New Zealand's administration. Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. Made with the support of New Zealand On Air. Listen now on the spin-off or wherever you get your podcasts. That's why you're going to Morrinsville to at last represent the rural centre. I'm going to Morrinsville because I'm an elitist Māori and I like to go to the most exclusive destinations, which is why I'm going to Morrinsville. We've got time to record the whole thing because of those because of the speed limit changes brought in by the Labour government. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> You'll be on the road for a while. Well, she'll 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 be just pulling into Morrinsville and there'll be someone changing the the speed signs from thirty to three hundred. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going. Tenakoto Kato, my name is Toby Manhire. It's the morning of Monday, November 27th, and there will be a buzz as we gather around Government House in Wellington as the ministers of a new National Act New Zealand First Coalition, aka the Wheat Bix Coalition, are sworn in. With me in the studio, Ben Thomas. Kia ora. Kia ora. And somewhere... I just got a text. I meant hello. Oh. Oh, yeah, good, good, Ben. That's way more appropriate. <laughs> um, where are you, Bells? Um, I'm at the Gull Force 10, just off the Waikato Expressway, uh-huh. on my way to Morrinsville, one of my favourite destinations. And the price of 95 is falling for all of New Zealand as we get back on track, even before your very eyes? The speed bumps are being as removed from the roads? <laughs> $2.60.7. Okay. Yeah. P- pick us up some. Uh, Will do. On Friday... The two agreements that make up New Zealand's first fully-fledged three-party coalition were signed after 41 days, 41 days since the election, uh, during which Christopher Luxon, who will be Prime Minister probably about now, like any any, any second now, uh, sorted through the additives and the variances to scale his big rock candy mountain. There are, I've heard around the cordis, bits of big rock <laughs> in the carpet under the doors floating in the pool. Sort of souvenirs, if you want any, from the you have to, negotiations. The, the key to a, a man like Christopher Luxon is that he can look at a big rock mm-hmm. and see Michelangelo's David <laughs> waiting to come out. That's beautiful. So it's it's X David. <laughs> it's, oh, it's wow. Just, it's David oh. Seymour in the kind of the thick oh, of my pose. Gosh. Oh, <laughs> And over three weeks of <laughs> negotiations, they carefully chipped and chiselled it out. Oh my god! I think this is a this is a whole bit in the making. Very grateful to uh, when we struggled around Big Rock, the um, uh, listeners who helped us out. That it's a, a core core concept and management consultancy. Ben, you wrote a column about that, and you actually very uh, acutely picked up as well that Winston Peters. Uh, well, well, Christopher Luxon had those various kind of business self-help canons. Winston Peters was was playing the rules. Is that what it's called? The rules? Yeah, the, the rules. The sort of uh, contemporary reference, it probably should have been like dating TikTok or trad wife or something. Right. But, yeah, the rules was a turn-of-the-century dating manual that, um, you know, said, you know, 
for, for when you're looking for Mr. Right, you know, never answer the phone. No. You know, if, if he makes, if he tries to make a, a date with you within two days of the weekend, say, sorry, I'm washing my hair. And in fact, Winston Peters literally said that when he didn't turn up in Wellington, when Seymour and Luxon had flown down to meet him, he was getting a haircut. He's at a barber like, on He, he was right playing very yeah, closely yeah. to the rules. Yeah, the rules say, <laughs> don't, don't, say you're going to be in Wellington and then don't go to Wellington. And yeah, then, that's right. Uh, treat, treat him mean, keep him keen. And uh... Before we get into the substance of the deals, and I will rattle through some bullet points in a moment, that stuff, the kind of dynamic between the three men, I don't know if if both of you watched the press conference, but it was fascinating to me. We've got this kind of strange co-share arrangement, contiguous deputy leader, deputy prime minister arrangement that was the the only way out, negotiated in some, some manner of coin toss or whatever. Um, but in that presentation, there was in the banquet hall at the Beehive, and it struck me it was like, it was very much like an AGM and the CEO was Christopher Luxon. He was cheerful and announcing some results. And then David Seymour was very much like the CFO and sort of uh, enumerating the various uh, wins and the personnel that were advanced. And Winston Peters was like a comment section on the internet. <laughs> he just, he, he got up there and he just wanted to litigate again the question of whether it was 40 days or 20 days, you know, and then he got into an argument with the press gallery. The mathematical morons. <laughs> mathematical morons. There won't and, be any more <laughs> Jessica Tova. There won't That's be any more over Jessica, now. Jessica Tova. And that <laughs> is, I, I mean, is that, is that someone who is is failing to take the opportunity to communicate, articulate the wins they've achieved? Or is that someone who's smarter than all that and is going transcending all of that nonsense and speaking immediately to the people who just hate the media? Yeah, you know, I think that's right. I think that the wins that he achieved, and we'll get on to this, but there are some very significant policy wins in the New Zealand First Coalition Agreement. And then there are a lot of what I would call... Um, random cranky statements. Rhetorical um, flourishes would be another <laughs> way to put it. Rhetorical flourishes, yeah. <laughs> the, um, which, which really are just about a mood, yep. right? You know, and we'll get onto this, but saying, oh, from now on, government departments will communicate primarily in English. Well, every, every government department communicates primarily yeah, in English, yeah, right? Yeah. So New Zealand, it, it's uh, not English clear. will be made an official language in New Zealand. It already is. It already is. It's just not in, in the yeah. legislation, right? Yeah. But the legislation is in English, which is a bit of a clue. And, but, but at the same, so, so part of communicating the wins, I think, is talking, is showing his followers that I'm not, I'm not some, you know, little poodle or whatever for the um, for for these other parties. Mm. I I am setting the tone. I will be settling scores. Mm. Um, you know, <laughs> I think the best score settling in the um, the agreements is a specific one saying that the no surprises rule uh, in government, which uh, is is about you know information that agencies provide to uh, the ministers should be amended to uh, take into account the privacy requirements for individuals, which is a direct callback to when his personal information right. about his superannuation yeah, right. yeah, was, yeah, yeah. was disclosed by <laughs> officials to ministers. Like, just incredible, yeah. Yeah. incredible detail to pettiness. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's actually good policy. You know, that's a, that's a good advancement. But, uh, but you know, it is, it is very so much these pointed, about, sort of salty... Little addendums, and, they? yeah, and you see, and you've you've already seen it online. People who are so, you know they're like, oh, we're back, you know, yeah. the country's yeah. back, yeah. primarily in English, you know, yeah. and I and I think that you know th that is a direct call out, saying so, you know, no more Tova, no more Jessica, no more of you talking. That was a, the that was a real point in the particular parts of the internet, that whole thing. And about what did you make of the dynamic between these three men? What struck me is. You know, when Winston said he was taking New Zealand back, I didn't realise he meant back to the 1970s. But, um, you know, obviously his supporters really loved it. It was interesting to watch the dynamics between him and Luxon. I think it put Luxon in a really awkward position. He wants to come across as an effective CEO-type leader who's got all of his exec lined up, the T's and C's are are all in there. He was there to roll them out. You know, they were very. He was very open about what the um, what the plan was. 
but Winston creating a sideshow makes him look like he's not really in charge. And he was sort of trying to interject and and cool it down, but you can tell he's almost a little bit frightened to interject because that might send Winston off more or be perceived as rude. And in the meanwhile, uh, you know, Seymour was trying to look like he was absolutely playing everything <laughs> by the by the rules. So I saw someone describe them as the Hydra on um, Twitter the other day, and I think how those three personalities coexist in one government is going to be really interesting to watch. It was amazing looking at the collection of photographs from various different outlets, including photographs on the social media accounts of those involved. There was seemed to be... Very, very few. There were there were a few, but almost all of them had one of the three, you know, with some expression of variously despair, distraction, <laughs> fury. I don't know. You know, that's the nature of a class photo, right? Like, there's always a bit of that, but there is some sense that it's in a way. I think it's the the third part that is the tricky one, while the other two are involved in some in some way. It's a huge test, and yeah, if Winston Peters is going to play thorn in the side from literally day one. Have Christopher Luxon, as you say, Annabelle go, <laughs> okay, come on then. Come on then, everybody around. What's it going to be like in a month? It also makes you, it's hard not to be sceptical about the way that the contiguous deputy prime ministers have been dealt out insofar as if Winston Peters had been the second half, the second tranche, then you might say, oh, that's good that he'll be in there for the last But He now has, he now vacates the deputy prime minister office. Yes, he'll still be foreign minister. Yes, he'll still be in cabinet. But that gives him more freedom to become, you know, to, to rip the handbrake from the chassis and start, you know, thwacking it around as he's wont to do. And and that halfway point is sort of where you start to see the coalition partners or the support parties really struggle often in the polls. So, mm. you know, a number mm. of people have made that observation and I think it is well made um, that there would be a bit more security, I think, for Luxon. Um, uh, and and well, the government as a whole yeah. were Winston to take that second uh, shift. Um, Seymour, but you do it month on, month off, you know. <laughs> or like, how do the Swiss do it? Anyway, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Eight-day rotations just yeah. to keep things interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, Seymour, interesting, yeah, again, very, very sort of um, – very straightforward, very solid, very serious, um, as we saw him probably in the dying stages of the campaign. Um, I actually think maybe he could stand to take a bit of a leaf out of Peter's book. Mm. Yeah, Seymour was very popular as as a politician. A lot of, you know, Act's resurgence is totally down to Seymour and his leadership, you know, and, and a few things fell their way, but he capitalised on them. And, and it really is that leadership and, and his personality which has driven the resurgence of ACT into a, a you know, pretty serious player now and into government. Um, but he seems to be, you know, with the exception of the sort of weak picks comment recently, he's sort of, you know, he's kind of sanded off the edges a bit, mm. you know, now that he's on the big stage. And I'm... I, I'm not sure it's working too well for him. You know, they got some, you know, he he got some serious policy gains and I think he would have wanted to, you know, foreground those rather than, you know, uh, you know, having a big song and dance or turning it into a circus. Um, But I I do hope he loosens up a bit, uh, you know, for his own sake. Hmm. Um, You mentioned the focus that they have on achieving wins for their supporters and it seemed to me in this arrangement, more than any so far in MMP, the parties have had at the front of their minds creating an, a, a, creating a, a, a deal that has a focus on the next election. Like, obviously, that's always part of the calculation, but having a whole bunch of stuff, whether in substance or in that rhetorical material, that you can go back in 2026 and say, were it not for us... With the, this is what we got. Well, there, there's actually an interesting part in the coalition agreements, which where they're talking about who'll support what, and you know all the parties will support each other's agreements, yep. and we'll all support Nationals' fiscal plan, uh, hundred point plan, or hundred day plan, and hundred point plan. Hundred day plan, thousand point economic <laughs> plan, isn't it? <laughs> oh yeah, thousand points. Sorry, yeah. yeah, and. There's also a passage in there that says um, where there are policies that overlap. 
the party, the other party, may also claim this as a win for yep, their policy. Yep, exactly. So clearly, very much focused on who's who can take credit Ac- for acknowledge things. and promote the yeah. word something like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and and. So everyone's mind is on how do we make sure we don't get caught up in the slipstream and that people know that we delivered yeah, this for yeah, our voters. Yeah, yeah. Kia ora, I'm Duncan Grieve, founder of The Spinoff. You can help us keep all of The Spinoff's award-winning journalism free for everybody by becoming a member today at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. Are you curious about how business can be better? I'm Simon Pound, and I host Business is Boring, a podcast where I caught it all with some of the most interesting people in entrepreneurship, commerce, and making things happen. Tune in to Business is Boring every Tuesday, brought to you by the Spinoff Podcast Network in partnership with Spark Business Lab. Um, let me just go through some of the... I mean, there's a lot in there. Uh, many of you will have read them from top to bottom, but let me just give a, a sort of summary. If, if you know everything, if you know it all already, fast forward by 30 or 45 seconds. But basically, each of ACT and New Zealand First get three cabinet ministers each. Uh, ACT gets four outside cabinet, New Zealand First three. As, as just touched on, it's important to remember that in both of these agreements, the 100-day plan that National released in the campaign and its fiscal plan and its, I think, 1,000-point economic plan are the kind of default foundation. So if they're not expressly uh, contradicted or ruled out in any of these agreements, then they become the policy program for this term of government. Uh, National's foreign buyer tax goes because that's been the way it's described. In fact, the foreign buyer access goes is, the, is more to the point. Uh, so that leaves New Zealand First able to say that we won't have foreign buyers back in the property market. It also leaves a bit of a gap as far as revenue is concerned. One of the ways that tax gap is being filled is because there is also the repeal, thanks principally New Zealand First and Bit2 Act, of uh, smoke-free legislation, which means there'll be more excise coming in from tobacco. Uh, Act gets its uh, regulation minister and the red tape reduction policy pushed through. New Zealand First gets like a shaved down and redefined version of the Provincial Growth Fund, uh, $1.2 billion for infrastructure, regional infrastructure fund. There will be the Treaty Principles Bill, which ACT had wanted to... uh, to, to win a referendum on will be supported through to select committee. Um, as we know that you have your first reading, then select committee, then sec- second reading, then third reading, and off you go into law. It means that only up to select committee will be supported by the coalition. There it will mean that there will be a kind of version of an inquiry insofar as the select committee will scrutinise the legislation as it is and will have submissions and it will get some of the stuff, but it won't get the referendum. Partnership schools slash charter schools reintroduced. Uh, New Zealand First gets its inquiry into COVID-19. We already have an inquiry into COVID-19, but they want it to be public, which will be interesting. They also want to look at things like vaccine efficacy and procurement, which is obviously a play to a particular constituency. Light rail in Auckland is gone. Let's get Wellington moving is gone. Uh, There is a particular requirement that, quote, reduce expenditure on cycleways. Uh, The ban on on the pseudoephedrine is gone, which I think is the one that just about everyone will be happy. A very unorthodox, quite specific $6 million a year in this incredible helicopter view, big picture coalition deals. $6 million a year for Mike King's Gumboot Friday charity. Uh, The restoration of interest deductibility for landlords will be sped up. Uh, The pendulum swings back towards landlords more generally in terms of things like notice periods. Tightening the screws on beneficiaries, more funds for IRD tax audits. Uh, The Therapeutic Products Act will be repealed uh, some movements towards a four-year term referendum on that. Everyone wants that. Um, ACT has won a big one for a part of its support, a review of the firearms registry and re- rewrite, I think, is the the verb of the Arms Act. There are culture war wins across the board, some of which we touch on. There's one in the curriculum, refocus the curriculum on academic achievement and not ideology, including the removal and replacement of the gender, sexuality and relation-based education guidelines, whether or that form that takes will be interesting. Fees-free goes from year one to final year. 
select committee inquiry on banking competition, every single party is taking credit for repealing the clean car discount, scrapping the Māori Health Authority and fair pay agreements, among other things. Uh, and another one that I don't know, I quite like for some reason, that Act notes in its thing that, they, that National will not be proceeding with its taxpayer receipt. You know that thing, which is just like a that felt like a we need a policy for tomorrow. Has anybody got anything? What about everyone gets a receipt for their tax? And it's like that. That's gone. We're going to put a line through that. I quite like that. I don't know. Uh, I'm interested to hear what you all think of that. Um, uh, there's obviously lots to talk about, and there's lots that I haven't included in there too. Uh, did I mention there's that kind of going through all the legislation, looking for references to the treaty? Um, that's another one. We'll come back to that in a second. Quickly on tax. Quickly on tax. Uh, ben, there's some gaps there. We're going to have a, a fiscal update and we're going to have a mini budget before Christmas. Time is running short. Nicola Willis has said she is emphasising the mini. She's like, it's basically become nano now, I think, a nano budget before Christmas. Are you expecting to see more stuff them have to have to reconfigure or sort of put put a put a put a put a line through other stuff in their plans in order to deal with the opening of the books? Yeah, well I mean if you look at the if you look at the fiscal plan as presented by National, obviously you take out the foreign buyers tax arguments aside over, you know, it's it's its potential effectiveness, that leaves a seven hundred million dollar nominal hole each year. Mm. Um or gap, sorry, and the and and you know, and once you start totting up, you know, regional infrastructure funds, well, that doesn't so much count in the operating expenditure. That'll be capital expenditure, but it's still still a cash. Yeah. It's still a cash expense. It's still money the government spends. Um, it doesn't all add up, right? And – or it's not likely to add up. Uh, Nicola Willis has said – Correctly, that they did leave buffers, you know, for our, our contingencies in their buffers. fiscal plan, pretty tight ones, but buffers. you know, buffers nonetheless. And we've already seen that the coalition agreements aren't the whole story. There were a couple of things um, mentioned, uh, I think, by Luxon on Friday or Saturday, um, such as uh, getting rid of the um, uh, raising the threshold for abatement for working for families yeah. for the in work tax credit, which means if you're sort of if you're marginally employed, uh, part-time worker, parent, uh, you know, you, you would get working for families to encourage you back into the workforce, that benefit starts abating pretty steeply once you reach a certain level, and that level is not that many hours this week uh, per week with the rise of the minimum wage and inflation. Mm. Um, so the idea was to give a bit more headroom. Uh, that's gone now. Um, you know, you, you would th- you know, if you ask the but all the parties, you know, do you think it's important that um, people who aren't in full time work, you know, do do get back into the workforce as parents? They'd probably say yes. So, you know, a bit of an inconsistency there. But look, you know, there will be sacrifices that they have to make. Um, so it, it, there, there, I'm sure that there'll be a raft of other things that are on the list. Uh, you know, that that you know may currently be regarded as sort of promises or policies that are, are probably going to be on the chopping block to make that uh, the mini budget add up in mm. the short term. Mm. Uh, Annabelle, looking at it in the round, there are quite a few references to issues around co-governance, obviously, uh, which all three parties are dead against. But also, except when it comes to certain configurations, uh, you know, like Kohangareo and or whatever, um, but but what's your looking at it in the whole? What 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 is the message to Maori in the in the in these deals? Um, I think it, it comes across as an assault on every aspect of Maori society, from um, from health to education to justice to Oranga Tamariki. I mean, Oranga Tamariki was compelled to, um, you know, to devolve power to iwi and to place tamariki within their whānau hapu iwi. When you think back about what was happening in the, you know, the early 2000s when there were lots of um, high-profile child abuse cases and people would be screaming from the mountaintop, why aren't Māori leaders stepping up and resolving this problem and blah, blah, blah. And now that... uh, something iwi had always wanted to do and since then iwi have like got themselves in a position where they um, have 
have resourced themselves and worked with Oranga Tamariki to resource themselves to care for their own tamariki. So we're not getting a repeat of what we've seen in this in the historical state abuse inquiry. We have generations of kids scooped up, um, abused in state care, um, then um, put into jail for an apprenticeship and crime, and then becoming like hardened gang members and all the rest of it. Now that we are in a position to care for their own tamariki as requested, they're getting rid of it. So or, you know, the admissions policy. Tama Pōtaka during the election campaign talked about Max Kawanatanga and wanting to get rid of Max Kawanatanga. Now we have 28 ministers and the government is telling universities what their admissions policy should be when it comes to uh, encouraging Māori and Pacifica students to enter into medicine. So, you know, justice, three strikes, everywhere you look, this government is going to have a huge impact on every aspect of Māori society. Yeah, I, look, I think it's it's totally right that the overall tone is a big middle finger you know whether it's whether it's just to Maori or whether it's to the establishment. You know the the the, the greenstone carving, wearing what is it, shiny bottoms or whatever Winston Peters calls them. And you know it is it is I think it is definitely the most regressive policy platform that we've seen. You know. Uh, in, in terms of Māori, probably ever. Yeah. In terms of in yeah. terms of rolling things back, certainly yeah. probably since the you know twenty, um, you know the repeal of <laughs> Te Uruweta District Native Reserve Act in nineteen twenty one. Um, but and and the weird, the, the most interesting thing is a lot of it's just microaggressions. You know, it is these things that. A lot of it are, are things that that won't have, you know. This is not there was there are plenty that is substantive in there, but there are all these sorts of things like um, you know the primary language has to be English and changing back Maori names and mm. um, and 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 it's almost just a sort of nasty busybody sort of thing that you know where you're really sort of like yeah like the the enrolment scheme for uh, medical school you sort of think is this what the government needs to be concerned with. Um, this kind of micromanagement um, of, of etiquette, essentially, in a lot of cases, and I, I, I look, I, I, I hold out sort of diminishing optimism um, for, for some of these things in terms of, you know, there are actually, you know, some issues that could be that could be profitably addressed. I think by the government, you know. Um, I, I think you know the idea of reviewing every treaty clause in in all legislation where it exists, and I, I read that slightly differently to I think how RNZ RNZ talked about it this morning as removing treaty clauses from most yeah. legislation. That's not what I got from the, uh, the the policy. It it was reviewing it to either provide a specific. Um, to make it specific to that principles. legislation so it wasn't generic. Yeah, which is a trend yeah. for new legislation since 2015 where the idea is that the Crown will, you know, in partnership and consultation with Māori yeah. will decide how the principles are expressed through the law and then they will write that down. Now, that will actually be a really interesting exercise because if you go through and look at, say, uh, the Conservation Act or the Resource Management Act or something, Tama Potaka was the chief executive of Naitaiki Tamaki yeah. when they won some extremely significant court victories in terms of Adam, you know, enumerating what those rights were. So I don't think it's, it's, it's a matter of either deleting or codifying where the rights exist. And that's a – first of all, it's a huge undertaking. I don't, I don't think they'll get very far on it. Um, but but second of all, it actually risks uh, putting into legislation – you know, risks from a New Zealand first point of view – putting into legislation rights that they think are arguable or they disagree with. So it'll be really interesting because the person who's steering a lot of this work is Tama Potaka, who's yeah. a National Party MP, who's got an iwi uh, – a background in post-settlement iwi, who – 
is not an act or a New Zealand first MP, and so I, I'm really interested to see how it plays out. Yeah, just 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 so so to clarify, it says uh, conduct a comprehensive review of all legislation except when it is related to or substantive to existing full and final treaty settlements that includes quote the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi end quote and replace all such references with specific words relating to the relevance and application of the treaty or repeal the references. You're right. So it could end up being uh, being more more detailed and more substantive. That comes, Annabelle, directly after another uh, another bullet point in the New Zealand First National Agreement, which is amend the Waitangi Tribunal legislation to refocus the scope, purpose and nature of its inquiries back to the original intent of that legislation. So it falls part as part of this general push, particularly from New Zealand First, against what they consider to be overreach by the Waitangi Tribunal and by the judiciary in general, right, into 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 these 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 things. Well, the irony is, is that that's what's in the Waitangi Act is for the tribunal to investigate breaches of treaty principles. And I was talking to a a, a treaty lawyer the other night who warned that the review itself could be subject to a treaty claim. Right. Um, well, it almost, it almost certainly will be. Uh, yeah. yeah, if it doesn't include Māori. So, I mean... Springtime it, for lawyers. <laughs> it really is, you know. like The, the people who are going to benefit most from what's happening at the moment is actually lawyers. The other irony is that, you know, in terms of the whole two laws for all argument and making, you know, one law for all... Where there genuinely are two laws for all, this coalition agreement is silent. Where there's two laws, laws for uh, two laws in play, is things like Maori land, where Maori land can be locked up in perpetual leases forever and a day, completely unfairly, and for peppercorn rentals. There's nothing about that. There's nothing about releasing the thousands of acres of Maori land that Maori are currently being deprived of because they're subject to perpetual leases. There's nothing about the tens of thousands of acres of Māori land all around the country that Māori are literally physically locked out of because they're completely landlocked. Great, great uh, recent episode of Mata, which touched on some of those issues that I think you can watch on TVNZ online. That's right, TVNZ Plus. Thank you, Ben. You can watch it on TVNZ Plus or YouTube. That's Mata. (laughs) <laughs> or, or as we call it now, matters. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, that's why it matters. Um, as you now go and continue your journey into rural matters, you're refocused. <laughs> refocused. Can I say, um, I was interested to see Paulder Goldsmith as the Minister of Treaty Settlements again. Uh, or not again, but the Minister of Treaty Settlements. And I had a little look through his Wikipedia page and saw that he has a black belt in Taekwondo. And I thought, I cannot think of a more... Perfect <laughs> qualification <laughs> to get the Ngāpuhi settlement done than having a black belt in, in Taekwondo. So I'm very excited to see what happens there. He's also, what, what, what iwi was he affiliated to by Nikki Kay? Nati Poro. Nati Poro. His great grandfather, who was a pro, I mean, it's like, you know, like, was it 10% of the world's population is descended from Genghis Khan? Yeah. And it's like about 20% of Near New enough. Zealanders descended Near from enough. Paul Goldsmith. Near like enough. Absolute player. <laughs> great grandfather. <laughs> Ngati Ipsum. Um, all right. I think we, we've got heaps, heaps more to talk about and we will do so uh, in the future. Um, but let's wrap it up there um, and say good luck out there in Morrinsville, Annabelle. Thank you. Don't be jealous. Not everyone gets to spend time in Lawrenceville. Good luck out there, Ben and Wellington. Uh, thank you, Samuel. Thank you, members. Don't forget to look at our Pledge Me thing for our uh, cool new campaign. Kia ora. Kia ora, I'm Alex Casey, Senior Writer at The Spin-Off. We wouldn't exist without the ongoing support of our generous members. If you're able to, you can make a donation at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. Do you find it hard staying optimistic with all the financial news in the media? I'm Bernard Hickey, and on my podcast, When the Facts Change, I'm here to help you navigate the ever-changing landscape of economics in Aotearoa. 
So join the conversation every Friday on When the Facts Change, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network in partnership with KiwiBank. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.